In the wake of the inquest into the tragic events of 7-7, you may be curious to discover that there are still many questions left unanswered. Evidence presented seems to be contradictory, and CCTV footage is either strangely edited or missing altogether. It's a difficult subject due to the horrors and the loss of life on that fateful day. But some family members of victims remain unconvinced by the official version of events. In many instances, the facts just don't add up, making it seem that there is a very suspicious attempt to, con to conceal the truth. They wouldn't do that, would they? Let's find out as we go On The Edge. everybody welcome to on the edge i'm alex g your host and don't forget this is interactive this is live tv you can take part don't forget the way to do it is to text 86686 you start with the word edge e d g e leave a space then give us your message and taking those messages tonight is Melissa. Melissa, welcome again to the show. Thank you. And I must admit, the wardrobe is getting more vivid as the days <laughs> go by. I'm trying to keep up with you, Alex. Oh, well, there we go. There we go. <laughs> so it's something to uh, go alongside our black backdrop. So let me introduce our guest tonight, uh, Tom Secker. Welcome. A researcher, filmmaker, and best known uh, for your work to date of Seeds of Deconstruction. Uh, a very, very sort of tight expose of where the facts don't quite match in the 7-7 uh, inquests and uh, evidence that has been presented to the public. Now, please tell me, what actually inspired you to get involved in doing a movie like that? Well, I mean, it, it, I've had a, an interest in, in researching terrorism for many years, um, ever since I was a student, really. Mm -hmm. And when 7-7 happened, I instantly felt that you know this was something that didn't really add up that what we were being told probably wasn't true mm -hmm. um, over time it's it's become clearer that it really probably isn't true and mm -hmm. I, I felt that the existing movies that were out there that were about 7-7 mm -hmm. maybe didn't cover everything that they should do and yeah. there were other things to look at and so I felt it, it, it's time for me to enter this and, and, and do my own work on it. And certainly the difference between I think your movie and many others out there is you don't get into conjecture you you stick very much to the facts and let them speak for themselves yeah certainly or at least the reported facts at least you mm -hmm. know what it is that we've been told what reports say what the media have said yeah right well I think we get straight into um, a video clip at this mm -hmm. uh, point and this is video clip number three uh, if ET can stand by on that so we'll just have a look at this. Now, this is actual footage from Luton. Yeah, from, from uh, Luton yeah. Station Car Park. OK, and here we see that now. So talk us through it. What have we got here? What's going on? Well, this is at about uh, 10 to 7 on the morning of 7-7 of seven, seven itself. That car that you can see that's moving is um, being driven by Jermaine Lindsay, one of the, right. the four alleged bombers. Mm -hmm. He's just uh, He's been in the car park for over an hour, he, and now he's just reparking there on the right. Yeah. And... Um, I mean, he's, he's come across from Aylesbury, he's waiting for the other three to come down from Leeds. Right. Um, and, he, and he sits there for a minute, and, mm -hmm. and you'll see it in a sec that um, this is footage that the Metropolitan Police put out, yep. yet there's this mysterious edit of about 88 seconds. Um, so, so we're actually going to see a clip here for some reason. And there's the cut. Yeah. So, so why, why is that? Why, why, why have we lost 88 seconds? Oh, look, there's a Jaguar. Well, in that space yeah. that's in the foreground, you yeah. see another car has appeared in that, yeah. in that uh, that 88 second gap mm -hmm. um, so if you keep your eye on that but also keep your eye uh, in between the two columns of cars in the background yeah. because what you're going to yeah. see is the other three men mm -hmm. who've driven down from Leeds mm -hmm. they drive into the car park and they're going to park mm -hmm. on the right next to Jermaine Lindsay yeah. um, and just as they're doing that the, the Jaguar starts up as it, right. as it will in a second and it, and it drives off so, literally, this is where we've got the majority of the suspects um, together 
um, about to make their trip to London. Um, well, they're that. just about to meet up that yeah. morning, yeah. yeah. And that's the Jaguar driving off, and okay. you'll see the other car coming in at the back. Right, so... And then there's another mysterious, I think it's about 76 second cut, just yeah. as the Jaguar is driving past them. Right, right. And there you go. So we get another cut in there. And, and this isn't faulty equipment. This, this is literally um, a, a very strange edit going on. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've explained that there were mal malfunctions with other CCTV systems that morning. They've never said anything about Luton Station having that problem, so we can only assume mm -hmm. this is something that the Metropolitan Police or some other authority has actually cut out of the video. They've just, you know, taken those sections, they've blacked them out. Could they possibly be saying, oh, well, there's nothing to see there, we shouldn't worry about that, it's not really important. Do you think that's going to be their line back um, on that? Well, if, if the pressure is applied and people start forcing the question, that probably is what they're going to say. But, mm -hmm. I mean, where it gets really quite spooky is that uh, nine days earlier, on the 26th of June 2005, yep. three of the alleged bombers took a trip to London, mm -hmm. that, uh, and this has been dressed up as a sort of dummy run, a rehearsal right. or surveillance now, operation. So we've actually got footage of that. This is video one. So if VT can look to roll us video one. So don't forget, we're looking nine days before here. Oh, and there's the Jaguar parked in the same place again. Yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's parked in the exact same spot as far as we can tell. And, and the car that's highlighted mm. in, the, in the little green box, that is uh, Shazad Tanweer and Mohammed Sadiq Khan, I think, yeah. driving down from Leeds. There they go, they park mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a minute later in that footage, they, they go off into the station. So the question is, mm -hmm. you know, what's that Jaguar doing there? I mean, I, mean, I mean, certainly not um, a parking space per se. No, we're no. Actually, actually looking there at, at, at somewhere where you, you can guarantee a traffic warden would be sort of looming within sort of seconds, if not minutes. Yeah, to, so, to, yeah. to actually zap them on that. So something suspicious there. Now you were saying about that footage. The, the first clip we'd seen there had been about for ages, mm. but uh, it was only with the inquest that we actually got to see this previous. Uh, yeah. Nine day early. Yeah. Um, they had released some of the dummy run CCTV footage. Yeah. Uh, about back in I think 2008 they released some, and I think they released some mm -hmm. just in the days after 7/7. Mm -hmm. But that particular clip that shows the Jaguar in Luton Station car park on 28/6, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, we've only seen that's only become available in recent months on the inquest's mm -hmm. website. Um, and obviously they've had that footage for a yep. long, long time. Yep. It's only now that it's been made available to us. So it's only now that we can see that that Jaguar seems to be in the same spot at the same time as the alleged bombers are in Luton Station and only in that spot at the same time as they are in there. And, and you would think any inquiry would look into just eliminating that Jaguar mm. from the inquiry mm. just so that uh, you would people have like us don't come on TV and go, what's going on with the Jaguar? Yeah, sure, you would have thought that the police yeah. in their extensive £100 million investigation into 7-7, I mean, mm -hmm. they had that CCTV within days of the attacks, yeah. uh, and you would have thought, analysing that, they'd look at it and they'd say, OK, wh what about this mysterious car that's parked there on both days? Let's try and find out who that is, even if, as you say, even if it's just to eliminate them from mm. the inquiry, even if it's mm. just a red herring. Mm. But which they've never said they've... anything about it. The Metropolitan Police never issued any statement about that car, asking, did anyone see it there or who was in it or were you driving that car that morning or anything of the sort. It seems to go against standard police practice in, mm. in this sort of um, affair, really. Very much so. So in terms of what people know about 7-7, they will know that recently we've had the inquest verdict. So surely that's the end of it. We've had everything we need to know about the story, um, job done, and, and really it's an, an insult to the victims and a pressure to the families to constantly be raking over this. What would you be your response to that? I'd say that, I mean, in reality, if you... Um I don't know whether you, you saw this, but there was a press conference on the day of the inquest verdict right. that they had with various relatives or mm -hmm. of, of victims and survivors, and a high proportion of them, you know, almost all of them, in fact, were saying, we're still not satisfied here. We still think that there should be a full, you know, independent public inquiry to look at all of the outstanding questions. And mm -hmm. I don't know whether that Jaguar would be part of that, but yeah. certainly there's a lot of questions that they still have. And one of our forum members, Unicorn, um, mentioned the fact that it's one of these things about 7-7. We forget that the G8 summit was going on on the same day, literally, mm. and uh, over the, the same couple of days. And it's almost like their whole agenda was changed 
when this event happened? Oh, very much so. I mean, you had uh, on the first day of the Glen Eagle Summit, the G8 Summit up in Scotland, they were talking about additional aid to poor countries, they were talking about preventable diseases, all of the normal things you'd hope and expect would be at an international conference. Then, 7-7 seven, seven happens, bang, the mm -hmm. whole agenda changes and all they're talking about is security, the war mm -hmm. on terror, the need to be strong and everything else just went out the window. Okay. Well, don't forget, text in your comments on 86686 with the word EDGE, E-D-G-E, at the start. Then follow it with a space and your message, and we will be right back to hear your comments. Welcome back to On The Edge. I'm Alex G, and I'm here with my special guest, Tom Secker. But first, let's go and see what's been happening on the text. Let's see your comments. Melissa, what uh, abandon do we have from our texters? Uh, a few text messages starting to come in now. Uh, but before the break, uh, Brian77 from our web forum has said, uh, glad that you've got Tom on the show. He said, Seeds of Deconstruction is a very thorough documentary. Oh, a compliment. Lovely. Yes. That's what we like. <laughs> Uh, Dennis says, why aren't the Met investigating more thoroughly who or what is scaring them off? And he also asks, can you read the number plate of the JAG? That's an interesting thing. I, mm. I suppose this is down to the quality of CCTV. Is, mm. is there anyone who's been able to forensically analyse this? With, uh, not uh, that I've seen. I mean, I've, I've looked at that clip a number of times myself mm -hmm. and um, a lot of other people have. I've never been able to make out a number plate and I don't think... I don't think the, the, the footage is of good enough quality, or certainly not the releases that we have already. It certainly is this thing with CCTV footage that uh, it's very difficult to make anything stick mm. with, with this quality of material. Yeah, it, it, the resolution it, just isn't there, the quality of image just isn't there. So if we move on now to some of your major problems, let's mm. say, with the 7-7 official story as it stands, I gather there's um, an interesting little aside concerning explosive residues mm. at, at all the bomb sites that we're talking about here. Yeah. So, yeah. so what's the story there? Well, I mean, the story is that uh, in the initial days after 7-7, all of the reports unanimously were saying these were commercial or military-grade explosives. Yeah. They then discover this supposed bomb factory up in mm -hmm. Leeds, uh, mm -hmm. And the story changes, and they say these are now acetone peroxide. They are homemade right. explosives, yep. TATP, HMTD, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and they've maintained this story, and it's in all of the official reports and in all the media yep. coverage. Yep. But the problem is, um, and they confirmed all this in testimony at the inquests, is that they never actually found any chemical residues of the explosive used at any of the four locations. Well, that's very strange. To it say it is very strange. I mean, particularly when you consider that possibly with the exception of the bus, but on the tube trains at least, mm -hmm. you're talking about a very small area, a very sort of compact area. There's yep. not much wind there or rain or anything that would contaminate the scene or wash anything away. Normally, mm -hmm. in that kind of attack, in that kind of explosion, you would be able to identify the chemical residues within a matter of days. It, yep. shouldn't, it shouldn't be ambiguous, and yet mm -hmm. we're told there's just no evidence for this. Yep. And so the question, what caused those explosions, we essentially don't have an answer to. We don't know what caused the explosions. We don't know. We don't have any forensic right. evidence connecting those to this supposed bomb factory up in Leeds. Mm. And, and so without that piece of the puzzle, without that piece of the story, it's, it's hard to believe anything that they've said about it. And, I mean, we mentioned the bomb factory because that's how everything seemed to be tied together to say that these were, mm. were the guys that had done it and this is uh, the way that they carried out um, their action. But... I gather you were saying there's something very interesting about that bomb factory in terms of what was and what was not there. Mm. For instance, there a lot of uh, papers have covered the fact that in the bath, that's where they made the explosives. Yeah, that's supposedly where they you know, yeah. brewed them up and, and, and yeah. mixed the, the ingredients together and actually produced these bombs. Um, and, and for years, this was the story that you know, they, they boiled mm. up the bombs in the bathtub kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but now at the inquests, they're saying actually they didn't find any explosive residue really? or any sort of right. the, the leftovers of a chemical process to produce bombs. And they said that they think it's now some sort of pesticide, which is very, very, very strange. I mean, surely they mm. knew this years ago. So why have they spent the you know, five years, six years since saying that this was explosives? But if you ask people, 
they will still tell you, well, they were boiling up the bombs in the bath. Mm. And, mm. This, and this is completely um, fabricated from what we're saying. It seems to be, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, people believe this because mm -hmm. they've been told it over and over and over again. But in reality, you do a bit of picking, you do a bit of looking at it, mm -hmm. and, and the, the evidence simply isn't there. Okay, well, let's um, move on to uh, look at some of these sites and some of the diagrams. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps if we take uh, Piccadilly line first. Um, now, image five, I think, is of where they found Lindsay's body, who, mm. who, was, who was the alleged bomber. The supposed in, bomber, in, yeah. At Piccadilly. Yeah, this uh, is a, uh, a diagram that is drawn by a uh, forensic investigator, a, a policeman of some sort. Um, you see in the, in the middle of the diagram there is a, uh, what they call the bomb crater, that's presumably mm -hmm. where the explosion happened. But yep. on the right, at the end of the carriage, you see two areas marked X and Y. Mm -hmm. Now one of those is where they found Lindsay's identifying documents, his driver's license or whatever, right. um, and the other one is where they found his body. So you've got an explosion going off in the middle of the carriage, supposedly right. carried out by Jermaine Lindsay, yet his ID and his body are found right at the end of the carriage. And there's a real issue here, it, particularly mm -hmm. with the Piccadilly line, because mm. it was a very, very packed carriage, you know, yeah. absolutely chock full of people like, like tube yeah. trains can be. Yeah. Um, so in effect, what we're being told is Lindsay muscles his way onto the carriage, right. chucks his ID and his documents and his letters and what have you on the floor, mm -hmm. fights his way into the middle of the carriage, right. puts his rucksack down, blows himself up, kills nearly 30 people, okay. and then somehow flies back to the end of the carriage again, all without anyone noticing that this is, this is what he's doing. It sounds like um, stage directions from an X-Men movie, the <laughs> way that they've actually put that together. I mean, that is just so... It's the sort outrageous. of thing you could do with CGI, but yeah. would probably never happen in reality. Yeah, yeah. OK, well, let's keep to Piccadilly. Um, this is image four. And this details an extra hole in the carriage. So, yes. Tom, can you talk us through this? If, yeah, if you look closely on, on the right-hand side towards the rear end of the carriage... Is uh, this in the, the centre zone or at the top? Um, oh. This is in the centre, yeah. Right, yep. Um, you will see that they've, they've made notes on this as, mm -hmm. as, to, as to what's happened in this carriage. Um, and what they found, mm -hmm. towards the end where they found Lindsay's body, yep. it, they say that there is another crater, another hole, both in the floor of the carriage and in the ceiling. Now, presumably, okay. one bomb in a rucksack set down in the floor of a packed mm -hmm. carriage, it's going to blow yep. up there, it's going to cause the damage there. Mm -hmm. It's not going to cause another hole, you know, six, eight, maybe ten feet away. Mm -hmm. Yet, because they found his body at that end of the carriage, yep. you've got to wonder, is that where the explosion happened? In, and mm -hmm. that's what that caused that crater. But then, of course, mm -hmm. you're left with the question: What causes the other crater in the middle of the carriage? It, it's it's starting to become very, very puzzling when mm. you lay it out like that. We've got one more image from Piccadilly, which is image eight. Mm. Now, this is uh, the actual police diagram uh, of the carriage. Yeah, this is a uh, model that the MPS, the Metropolitan Police Service, put together, and and this was uh, available on the inquest website. And you can see, if you look closely, about uh, two-thirds going left to right, uh, two-thirds of the way along, that's where the explosion supposedly happened. That's where they have Lindsay, that's where they have the, the sort of purple part of the diagram indicating the explosion. So mm -hmm. they obviously think yep. it was there. It was by that set of, uh, the second set of double doors there, right. rather than anywhere nearer to the back of the carriage. But mm -hmm. from the, the, own, the testimony of their own police officers and their right. own diagrams that they've drawn, it suggests otherwise. Okay. Well, let's move on to Aldgate now, sure. and uh, we've got, got a trio of images uh, from that. Now, this is um, image one, and this is uh, by Michael Henning. So what, what are we looking at here? OK, Michael Henning was a, a passenger in the, in the next carriage along, towards the top of the screen. That's the carriage where the explosion happened. Mm -hmm. Michael Henning is in the next carriage. Uh, he's marked himself with an X and a little arrow saying, you know, that's right. where he got onto so the that's train. In, in the lower carriage there. Yeah. yeah. In the upper carriage, you can see next to one of the seats, this is where he says he saw a man. He doesn't particularly right. identify this man. He says his, okay. his recollection is somewhat, you know, dodgy as to quite what the man was wearing and so mm -hmm. on. But that little circle deck, that's where he says he, he saw someone. Yeah. And if you read the Home Office narrative, that man that they're talking about in that seat was uh, Shazad Tanweer, was the supposed suicide bomber at right. Aldgate. Okay. Um, 
Now, aside from the problem with Henning saying he's not really sure if he did see a man there or not, the problem is when you look at the other diagrams from mm -hmm. Oldgate, in particular, the uh, can we get up the, the Metropolitan Police diagram? From That's there. image six. So we've got the um, Metropolitan Police diagram into image six. Then what you see is he's not sat down in that seat. This is on the, the, the left hand side of your image. He's not sat down in that seat. He's actually stood in a standing area next to it. And right. that's where the explosion happened. Mm -hmm. And it should be a relatively straightforward process of yep. determining the centre of an explosion. Mm -hmm. And yet mm -hmm. they've got H Henning because his statement kind of coincides with the narrative. Yep. But it doesn't coincide with what the Metropolitan Police are saying. Right. So we've got a kind of divergence between the Home Office on the one side and the Metropolitan Police investigation on the other. Very strange. We've got one more image, which is image three. Um, this is by uh, Lizzie Kenworthy, a yeah. policewoman. Yeah, uh, she was. This a, is her drawing. A, an off duty police officer who was also in the next carriage with Henning. And, yeah. and after the explosion, she sort of crawled through. She helped the injured. She, I think she saved several people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can see on the, on the left hand side, there's uh, towards the bottom of the diagram, that's the, the, the big crater that she's drawn. And that's in the standing area. That's where the Metropolitan Police diagram has right. Tan Weir. It's not where the seat is, where Henning saw the man sat in a seat. Okay. Um, you also have significant damage to the whole area down mm. from there towards the mm. back of the carriage. And also, if you look at the top, just mm. right of center, she right. said that further up in the carriage, there was another hole in the side of the carriage. So how have you got an explosion, you know, taking place on mm. the left-hand side and then 15 feet up the carriage on the other side of the carriage, it's somehow blown a hole in the, in the side of it. This is quite extraordinary and we're, we're starting to see a pattern here mm. Mm. where the physical evidence doesn't marry up with anything else that we're getting. Yeah. Which is very, very strange. Tell you what, let's tackle um, Edgware Road mm. now. And this, uh, if we can have image two, uh, this is an illustration again by, by uh, uh, PC Potter, I yes, think. Yes, I believe so. Th so. This is his illustration. And if you look at uh, on the right, th that's his, his main uh, illustration of the carriage, you see he's drawn a crater, a hole in the floor, mm -hmm. right in the middle of the carriage, in, in the standing area between rows yeah. of seats. And he's uh, put numbers around. They are where they found bodies of, of right. people who were killed. Yeah. Um, now, the problem with this is that most witnesses, incidentally, do support that, that sketch. Most right. of the people right. in the carriage do yep. back that one up. But if you look at the uh, Metropolitan Police diagram okay. of, of the same scene at Edgware Road... Um, Which, uh, if we can pull up image seven uh, on that. So image seven, this is the actual Metropolitan Police sort of... Yeah, this is an, do illustration an, of an official, got. if you like, official yep. diagram. Mm -hmm. Then you don't have the explosion happening in that standing area. What you see on the... Uh, towards the left-hand side of the center, mm -hmm. you have a, a group of people in red. They are all the people who were who are sadly killed. Yep. And then if you look just down and to the left of them, there's a guy that's colored purple. That right. is supposedly Mohammed Sadiq Khan, okay. the alleged suicide bomber at Edgware Road. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that rather than right in the middle of the standing area, the place where they center the explosion is off to the left and closer to Khan who sat down in his seat. Right. So what you've got, in effect, is a situation where Khan would have to be sat in that seat, which is where the Home Office narrative says he was, yeah, yeah. Um, pushing his bomb on mm. the floor and sort of stretching away from the seat mm -hmm. and sort of between the legs of one of the people that he, he supposedly killed and then setting it off, which, you know, it makes absolutely it, it, no sense for a suicide bomber to do that. You, you get in and you just... Do it, surely. Well, and, and, this and is, uh, presumably, and, you'd, yeah. if you're a suicide bomber, you want to make sure that mm. you're going to be killed in your suicide bombing. I mean, yeah. you don't want to be left with your Lamed legs blown and off and, and yeah. dying for hours afterwards. So you'd have mm. it as close to your body as possible. Mm -hmm. So why would he be, you know? Which leaves us with the final bomb site, mm. which is the uh, more uh, different of the four, which is uh, on the bus in Tavistock Square. So again, we have a... The, um, Metropolitan Police Diagram, which is image nine. So, Tom, if you can talk us through um, where the anomalies are here. Well, here we have the, the, both the top and, uh, and the bottom deck of the bus. And, again, the, the people in red are people who are killed. The others are survivors. The one in purple on the, uh, the lower of those two diagrams, that is supposedly Hasib Hussain. And, right. and he's supposed to have, have, have put his bomb on the floor and, and blown himself up and killed all those people. Mm -hmm. Now, there's two sort of critical problems here. Uh, 
that is essentially what the narrative says, and that yeah. is what all the photographs say, is that mm -hmm. there was an explosion on the top deck towards the back of the bus, on that, yeah. towards that side. So that's all fine. The problem is, what place is Haseeb Hussain there? Mm. Um, and the thing is, none of those surviving witnesses in the nearby area really remember seeing Hussain. And some of them, you know, would have been staring straight at him. Some of them should have yeah. at least remembered yeah. someone sitting there, even if they yeah. couldn't identify Hussein in particular. Mm -hmm. They should have been able to identify someone there, but no one did. And there is another curious thing about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you must have sat on a bus in your time. I oh, mean, yes. yes. Yes, and, and, and how much space do you have between you and the seat in front? Usually not an awful lot. Not very lot. much. You, you know, if, if you're a tall man or a broad man. If you're over five foot, you have no leg at all. Yeah, yeah, you, you're yeah. squeezing your knees yeah. in and pressing mm. them against the seat in front. Mm. Yet somehow, Hasib Hussain, who was a big lad, you know, mm. he was about my height, about my kind of build, um, he's supposed to have taken his rucksack off and pushed it between his legs onto the floor and <laughs> then blown it up. Well, I've tried that with two bags of shopping and not yeah. possible. It's it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't really add no. up. So, yeah. you know... The implication is that none of these scenes are uh, truthful representations of, of so, what actually So when, when this was presented at the inquest, didn't any of this get twigged? Did, did no one go, excuse me, there seems to be some anomalies here? Um, not the lawyers in the inquests, no, and not the no. coroner at the inquests either. Even though this is pretty fundamental stuff, you know, mm -hmm. where did the explosion happen? Where were the people who were killed by it? Surely you would need to have that information in order to ascertain any kind of cause of death, which is mm. the purpose of the inquest. Um, and no, the only people who've brought it up are independent journalists, the July 7th Truth Campaign, of course, who were covering these inquests in, in yep. an awful lot of detail, um, people of that ilk. Let's find out more and get some responses from you via the texts at 86 after this break. Welcome back to On The Edge. I'm Alex G, and we're here with filmmaker Tom Secker talking about 7-7 and some inconsistencies that the inquest didn't actually pick up on. We're going to go straight over to your text now. It's all starting to flood in. So 86686 is the number. Here's Melissa. What we got? Oh, we've got lots of messages coming in at the moment. Uh, somebody's texted in saying it's a bit strange the Jag being there, but it doesn't really prove any wrongdoing, just pure speculation. Uh, John in Portsmouth says our government loves rehearsals, looks like a rehearsal, the alleged bombers and MI5 running things through. Mm. Um, there's been uh, many people texting in saying uh, who was shot at Canary Wharf? And one person pointed out if the bombers didn't die... Uh, or if the, why did the bombers buy return tickets if they were oh, suicide me. bombers? Uh, there's, a, there's a whole whole lot of um, uh, facts and speculation within all that. There is. So there is a bit, in, yeah. in, term, in terms of the JAG, um, we, we have this question of, OK, it doesn't prove anything. No, it doesn't but, prove anything by itself. Um, but what you do have there is the same car parked in the same place um, on two separate days at two different times. And that's, right. that's quite critical, because right. if this person is just some random commuter, yeah. if, they, if this is all a red herring, you would expect them to be at the same station at roughly the same time of day every day, because, mm -hmm. you know, they yeah, have yeah. a routine. Yeah. Um, but on 7-7, it's there at about 10 to 7 in the morning, mm -hmm. and on 28-6, the day of the dummy run, yeah, yeah. or whatever it yeah. was, um, it was there at about quarter past eight. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, that's over an hour, about an hour and a half out. So what kind of commuter arrives at a station an hour and a half yeah. on two different days? So I think mm. it isn't by itself solid proof of anything, but it, it is what it is. It's something should have that been the eliminated. police... Should have been eliminated. The police should have been quarry. looking at yep. it. Yeah. OK, in terms of... Now, we have that question, who was shot at Canary Wharf? Do you want to go into the background of where that question comes from and what your view is? Uh, yeah, sure, why not? One of the various things that came out in the reporting on the day of 7-7 was this notion that there had been some kind of police operation at Canary Wharf. Mm -hmm. And there was even this, this rumour going around that, that suicide bombers had been shot there by police marksmen. Yep. Now, that may or may not have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm dubious, to be honest, uh, for two main reasons. Firstly, there's a lot of different rumours going around on 7-7. There was stuff about, you know, up to eight different explosions on different tube stations. Right. Uh, trains going in the wrong directions, uh, maybe three different explosions on three different buses. 
not all of these mean that these things actually happened. It right. simply means that they were reported yep. as happening. Yep. Now, of course, that doesn't mean they didn't happen, but I think we should you know, be careful with, with how we source our information on this. Well, we could take it back to the start of it when we were told it was an electric power surge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. For the first hour or so after mm. these reports of explosions were coming in, they mm. were saying, you know, huge electrical failure, power surge, people getting electrocuted, mm. all of that. And that, that, that's what's caused the explosions. Mm. Um, again, it's a possibility but it's something we'd have to have more solid evidence to go on than simply yeah. a few media reports saying yeah. this way or that. Mm -hmm. And the final bit was on the return tickets. So uh, they've got return tickets. Yeah. Have they? Why have they? Well, there's a bit of contradiction here. Right. The Home Office narrative says that they must have had tickets to get down onto the platform at Luton because they went through the little ticket barrier checking yep. machine. Um, but they say they don't know which tickets they had or where, when they bought them or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the mainstream media, I think it was the, the Mirror, right. ran an article a couple of weeks after 7-7 saying, was it suicide? Mm -hmm. And one of the things they, they cited as, the, as mm -hmm. part of this question was the fact that these guys bought return tickets. Now, we don't know if that's true, but okay, mm -hmm. let's take it for granted that it is true just for the sake of argument. Yeah. That means that these guys, supposedly on a suicide martyrdom mission, bought tickets that would have gotten back to where they started from. Mm -hmm. which makes no sense. I mean, not only just because it's a waste of money, but it doesn't even make sense from a security point no. of view. No one no. would suspect someone of being a suicide bomber more just because they bought a single <laughs> ticket, yeah. would they? I yeah. mean, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really add up. We're, we're talking way beyond here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. really, really, really is you, you'd have to be very paranoid to, as yeah. a suicide bomber to do that, to yeah. go to that extent. Yeah. Now, this brings us to uh, video clip two. Now, mm -hmm. This is actually uh, when the BBC did their Conspiracy Files programme on 7-7. This was the big reveal, wasn't it? And here we go. We yeah, can yeah. see that now. What we're looking at here is a uh, clip from King's Cross on the morning of 7-7, and those mm -hmm. four arrows are pointing at four men carrying rucksacks who are supposedly the four alleged suicide bombers. And what they're saying is that is the last clip of mm -hmm. those men together on 7-7. There is nothing closer to any of the targets that mm -hmm. they, they, they allegedly bombed. There's no footage of them walking towards platforms, there's no footage of them getting yep. on trains, no yep. from the cameras inside the trains, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And the reason they explained this was at the inquests is that supposedly the CCTV system at King's Cross that morning malfunctioned. It right. was stuck on that one camera that we just saw yep. for the exact period that those four men were supposedly walking through the station from about 8.30 to about 8.50. Right. Um, and what's particularly strange about this mm -hmm. is that people have been asking for that footage pretty much since day one. Yeah. Various yeah. people, various different types and motives and what have you. Mm -hmm. They've never before mentioned this, this notion of uh, the CCTV system at King's Cross malfunctioning. And yeah. they've never said that that's, that's why we don't have those images and why we can't show them to you. Mm -hmm. It's only now, you know, five and a half, six years after the event, they mm -hmm. finally sort of pulled this excuse out of the bag. Mm -hmm. And, okay, maybe it's true, maybe that system did malfunction, but it's not very believable to me. Um, or if it did malfunction, perhaps there's more to the story as to why it and malfunctioned. We're once again into this business of selective CCTV footage that we're mm. allowed to see. Mm. And those who have been following us here on, on The Edge will know that there are various incidents like 9-11, and so forth, where, and, and the Princess uh, Diana tragedy. And where, the, uh, the Oklahoma City bombing in 95. Absolutely. All these incidents where the CCTV, just for that period of time, plays up. So, well, and we're told it's so important for our security. That's why we're covering yeah. our streets with thousands of cameras. That's mm -hmm. why you, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear from the CCTV cameras. Mm. Uh, mm. And yet it seems that at almost every critical event that happens in, in, in the history, not just of this country, mm. but of other countries as well, uh, the CCTV always seems to fail. So what use is it? What, what purpose does it even have? And this is the thing. We have more uh, cameras per head of population in the UK than anywhere else. Yeah, and we have 7-7 seven, seven as an illustration that it doesn't actually prove what is necessary to be proven to mm. stop all the doubt. Mm. And people are going to say, when, when they see this programme tonight, they're going to say, well, yes, there, there's, there's an anomaly there, there's, there's something strange there, and you're, in your film, Seeds of Deconstruction, you start by actually explaining the history of 
false flag terror incidents. Covert ops, Covert public deception, et all of that. So, I mean, are you leading in a particular direction on this then? Well, the reason why I put that in the film, um, obviously I have a suspicion that 7-7 was some kind of black op, otherwise I wouldn't have made that film. Right. Um, I don't know it was the case. I'm not pushing necessarily to say that people should believe that that was what happened. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying two things, really, in doing the film in that way. The first is to the mainstream media, mm -hmm. saying, because they've poo-pooed this notion, they've dismissed it as a conspiracy theory, they've ridiculed it, all the rest of it, mm -hmm. when in reality there are tons of historical precedents that suggest that could have been exactly what sort of, that's the thing that happened, because yeah. that's yeah. the sort of thing that has happened. Mm -hmm. But I'm also saying to the more alternative media-minded that mm -hmm. if you're going to maintain or argue the case for 7-7 being a black op or a false flag or whatever, then you have to know the history. You have to know what a covert op looks like yeah. before you then go and investigate 7-7 and say, well, OK, this is where it might match up to that theory. This is where it doesn't. The evidence takes you in different directions. You spot the patterns, effectively, mm. and, and that's the key to it. Because it's, it, it seems to be that the same modus operandi seems to play out in all of these. Uh, up to a point, certainly, yeah. 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 Um, I think there is some differences. I mean, people have pushed the connection between 7-7 and 9-11 for various reasons. And mm -hmm. maybe they're onto something there, maybe, maybe not. Um, one thing I will say is that, particularly with a 7-7 story, what's so obvious mm -hmm. to me is the number of red herrings there are. The right. number of, of things where we've just been taken down a particular path... Um, and it's then turned out to be untrue. And the CCTV is a great example of that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the conspiracy files, and, and what you had there is they, they got Nick Collistrom, who's one of the people who thinks that 7-7 was an inside job, was a covert yeah. op, mm -hmm. um, and he'd spent the three years basically going around saying, there's no CCTV from London, those four guys weren't even in London that yeah. day, yeah. Um, and claiming that the one frame we'd seen from Luton was a fake. So what do they do? They roll out CCTV from Luton showing a nice long you know, stretch of action, so kind of proving that it's authentic. I mean, I suppose yeah. the whole thing could be faked, but mm -hmm. taking it at face value. Yeah. And then they show him CCTV of these four guys walking through King's Cross, and, and he's flabbergasted, you know, because yeah. he's been rolled down a certain path, only for mm -hmm. them to cut him off. And um, the problem we have, with so many anomalies elsewhere in the story, it would be very easy for us to say... That how handy that that footage has come out at that particular moment. Possibly, yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. But whether that means that there's something up with that footage, it's been codded up or faked in some way, or whether it means that it's a more strategic ploy, if you like, yeah. um, I'm uncertain. Yes, the theory of the straw man, I think a lot of our viewers mm. know mm. all about. Let's see what we've got on the text. So over to Melissa. Melissa, tell us more. <laughs> Lynn in Sussex says, how on earth can people even begin to believe the shocking official story? What an insult. And John in Newport says, there are so many holes in the evidence. Um, Brian makes a comment uh, that there was no internal post-mortem on victims. And uh, Denise has, always, has also made a comment about uh, that there's been more than enough time to film four guys with rucksacks and just say that they're bombers. Right, which was uh, where we were looking just then. So, Tom, I mean, why do people have so much faith in the official story? Um, mostly because an awful lot of people haven't looked into it. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that, you know, if, you, if you're out there, if you're one of those people who does research 7-7 and, and is very motivated to do something about this, mm -hmm. one of the things you can do is spread this information to the people around you and encourage them to look at it. Mm -hmm. Because the more people look into this stuff, presumably yeah. the more people are going to see these massive holes and the absence of evidence and, and all the yeah. other problems. And yeah. so the less and less faith they will have in it. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, the number one reason why most people believe it is simply because they've been told it over and over again. It's mm -hmm. a nice, simple story that can be wrapped up in a box, yeah. stuck a pretty bow on, and they sell it to people. And this is the thing. We're so used to fiction on TV. Uh, mm. Spooks, for instance, comes to mind where everything's nicely packaged and you get the conclusion. Yeah, it's an episodic it. story. And there you are. Uh, the, the, and, in fact, people get really upset when their fiction doesn't deliver um, uh, an ending that they were expecting. If it's a little bit off the beaten track or inconclusive, but they'll ring into their TV company and complain. And uh, it, it's almost like you have to have uh, a conclusion that everyone mm. can get their head around with 7-7. Mm. 
And, and to be honest, that applies, I think, to, to if you like, both sides of it. Mm -hmm. It applies to those who are advancing this official conspiracy theory of yep. four homegrown suicide bombers mm -hmm. uh, with their, you know, bathtub homemade explosives. Mm -hmm. And it also applies to those who are pushing a particular conspiracy theory as to some kind of black op. Mm -hmm. That what they quite often do is mm -hmm. wrap it up in a nice little story in much the same way, yeah. push it, and they ignore all the other evidence that's surrounding it and all of the mm -hmm. problems, internal yeah. or external, cohesive problems mm -hmm. with any of these particular narratives. Now, we were saying there on the question that was saying about post-mortems on victims. Mm -hmm. This now, is huge. And we've also got the fact that uh, the inquest has now stated that there won't be an inquest in, into the four bombers. Yeah, the four alleged bombers, yeah. the four guys that supposedly did this. One of the things that uh, Lady Justice Hallett said in her conclusion in her report on the mm -hmm. inquests was that there will be no inquest into these, into these four guys. There will be no establishing of, ca of cause of death. Yeah. And that's a real problem because unless they can demonstrate that these four guys were, were in those places with those mm -hmm. bombs that they supposedly had and intentionally detonated themselves in suicide, suicide mm -hmm. attacks, yeah. then the whole narrative has a, has a huge hole in it, basically. But mm. if they never hold the inquest into those four guys' deaths, then they never have to answer that question. Interesting. Now, where can people find your film? Where can they find Seeds uh, of Deconstruction? All over the place. I mean, it's widely right. available online. It's on YouTube, the full yep. version, and in a, a playlist sort of split up into chunks. Mm -hmm. It's downloadable on uh, blip.tv and Stageview mm -hmm. and several other video sharing websites. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite easy to find. If you Google it, it comes straight up. And I should say, I should point uh, people in the direction of the July 7th uh, websites as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, uh, they've been doing sterling they, work. Because they recommended Tom to us, so thank you very much. You, you did a sterling job in saying that to us. So it, it's been terrific to see you here, Tom. Thanks, thanks very much for thanks joining for us. Thanks for having me on. It, it's been our absolute pleasure. Just leaves me to say a, a few bits and pieces. Do sign up for our newsletter, which you can find at our website. And that website is edgemediatv.com. And why not follow us on Twitter? Uh, our Twitter account name is uh, on the screen there. Uh, we could do with lots more of you and you get the full up-to-date information there as to what's coming up uh, on the edge and through the rest of Edge Media TV. So I uh, hope you uh, go and join us on our forums at edgemediatv.com. Uh, come and see what people have had to say about all this. There's been some uh, real ratcheted up debate, which leads me to say... Under the radar, around the world, you've been on the edge. In the wake of the inquest into the tragic events of 7-7, you may be curious to discover that there are still many questions left unanswered. Evidence presented seems to be contradictory, and CCTV footage is either strangely edited or missing altogether. It's a difficult subject due to the horrors and the loss of life on that fateful day. But some family members of victims remain unconvinced by the official version of events. In many instances, the facts just don't add up, making it seem that there is a very suspicious attempt to, to conceal the truth. They wouldn't do that, would they? Let's find out as we go On The Edge. everybody welcome to on the edge i'm alex g your host and don't forget this is interactive this is live tv you can take part don't forget the way to do it is to text 86686 you start with the word edge e d g e leave a space then give us your message 
and taking those messages tonight is Melissa. Melissa, welcome again to the show. Thank you. And I must admit, the wardrobe is getting more vivid as the days <laughs> go by. I'm trying to keep up with you, Alex. Oh, well, there we go. There we go. <laughs> so it's something to uh, go alongside our black backdrop. So let me introduce our guest tonight, uh, Tom Secker. Welcome. A researcher, filmmaker, and best known uh, for your work to date of Seeds of Deconstruction. Uh, a very, very sort of tight expose of where the facts don't quite match in the 7-7 uh, inquests and uh, evidence that has been presented to the public. Now, please tell me, what actually inspired you to get involved in doing a movie like that? Well, I mean, it, it, I've had a, an interest in, in researching terrorism for many years, um, ever since I was a student, really. Mm -hmm. And when 7-7 happened, I instantly felt that, you know, this was something that didn't really add up, that what we were being told... Jaguar mm. from the inquiry, mm. just so that uh, you people would have like us don't come on TV and go, what's going on with the Jaguar? Yeah, sure, you would have thought that the police yeah. in their extensive £100 million investigation into 7-7, I mean, mm -hmm. they had that CCTV within days of the attacks. Yeah. Uh, and you would have thought, analysing that, they'd look at it and they'd say, OK, what, what about this mysterious car that's parked there on both days? Let's try and find out who that is, even if, as you say, even if it's just to eliminate them from mm. the inquiry, even if it's mm. just a red herring. Mm. But Strange They've never said event. anything about it. The Metropolitan Police never issued any statement about that car, asking, did anyone see it there, or who was in it, or were you driving that car that morning, or anything of the sort. It seems to go against standard police practice in, mm. in this sort of um, affair, really. Very much so. So, in terms of what people know about 7-7, they will know that recently we've had the inquest verdict. So, surely that's the end of it. We've had everything we need to know about the story, um, job done, and, and really it's an, an insult to the victims and a pressure to the families to constantly be raking over this. What would you be your response to that? I'd say that, I mean, in reality, if you, um, I don't know whether you, you saw this, but there was a press conference on the day of the inquest verdict right. that they had with various relatives or mm -hmm. of, of victims and survivors, and a high proportion of them, you know, almost all of them, in fact, were saying, we're still not satisfied here. We still think that there should be a full, you know, independent public inquiry to look at all of the outstanding questions. And mm -hmm. I don't know whether that Jaguar would be part of that, but yeah. certainly there's a lot of questions that they still have. And one of our forum members, Unicorn, um, mentioned the fact that it's one of these things about 7-7. We forget that the G8 summit was going on on the same day, literally, mm. and uh, over the, the same couple of days, and it's almost like their whole agenda was changed when this event happened. Oh, very much so. I mean, you had, uh, on the first day of the Glen Eagle Summit, the G8 Summit up in Scotland, they were talking about additional aid to poor countries, they were talking about preventable diseases, all of the normal things you'd hope and expect would be at an international conference. Then, 7-7 seven, seven happens, bang, the mm -hmm. whole agenda changes and all they're talking about is security, the war mm -hmm. on terror, the need to be strong and everything else just went out the window. Okay, well don't forget, text in your comments on 86686 with the word EDGE, E-D-G-E, -E, at the start, then follow it with a space and your message and we will be right back to hear your comments. Probably wasn't true. Mm -hmm. um, over time it's, it's become clearer that it really probably isn't true. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I felt that the existing movies that were out there that were about 7-7 seven, seven, mm -hmm. maybe didn't cover everything that they should do. Yeah. There were other things to look at, and so I felt it, it, it's time for me to enter this and, and, and do my own work on it. And certainly the difference between, I think, your movie and many others out there is you don't get into conjecture. You, you stick very much to the facts and let them speak for themselves. Yes, yeah, certainly, or at least the reported facts, at least, mm -hmm. you know, what it is that we've been told, what reports say, what the media have said, yeah. Right. Well, I think we get straight into um, a video clip at this mm -hmm. uh, point, and this is video clip number three, uh, if ET can stand by on that. So we'll just have a look at this. Now, this is actual footage from Luton. Yeah, from, from uh, Luton yeah. Station Car Park. OK, and here we see that now. So talk us through it. What have we got here? What's going on? Well, this is at about uh, 10 to 7 on the morning of 7-7 of seven, seven itself. That car that you can see that's moving is um, being driven by Jermaine Lindsay, one of the, right. the four alleged bombers. Mm -hmm. He's just uh, He's been in the car park for over an hour, he, and now he's just reparking there on the right. 
Yeah. And um, I mean, he's he's come across from Aylesbury. He's waiting for the other three to come down from Leeds. Right. Um, and he and he sits there for a minute, and mm -hmm. and you'll see it in a sec that. Um, this is footage that the Metropolitan Police put out, yep. yet there's this mysterious edit of about 88 seconds. Um, so, so we're actually going to see a clip here for some reason. And there's the cut. Yeah. So, so why, why is that? Why, why, why have we lost 88 seconds? Oh, look, there's a Jaguar. Well, in that space yeah. that's in the foreground, you yeah. see another car has appeared in that, yeah. in that, uh, that 88 second gap. Mm -hmm. um, so if you keep your eye on that, but also keep your eye uh, in between the two columns of cars in the background, yeah. because what you're going to yeah. see is the other three men dri mm -hmm. who've driven down from Leeds. Mm -hmm. They drive into the car park and they're going to park mm -hmm. on the right next to Jermaine Lindsay. Yeah. Um, and just as they're doing that, the, the Jaguar starts up, as it, right. as it will in a second, and it, and it drives off. So, literally, this is where we've got the majority of the suspects um, together, um, about to make their trip to London. Um, well, they're that. just about to meet up yeah. that morning, yeah. yeah. And that's the Jaguar driving off, and okay. you'll see the other car coming in at the back. Right, so... And then, there's another mysterious, I think it's about 76 second cut, just yeah. as the Jaguar is driving past them. Right, right. And there you go. So, we get another cut in there. And, and th this isn't faulty equipment, this, th this is literally um, a, a very strange edit going on. Yeah, I mean, they've, they've explained that there were mal malfunctions with other CCTV systems that morning. They've never said anything about Luton Station having that problem, so we can only assume mm -hmm. this is something that the Metropolitan Police or some other authority has actually cut out of the video. They've just, you know, taken those sections, they've blacked them out. Could they possibly be saying, oh, well, there's nothing to see there, we shouldn't worry about that, it's not really important? Do you think that's going to be their line back um, on that? Well, if, if the pressure is applied and people start forcing the question, that probably is what they're going to say. But, mm -hmm. I mean, where it gets really quite spooky is that uh, nine days earlier, on the 26th of June 2005, yep. three of the alleged bombers took a trip to London, mm -hmm. that, uh, and this has been dressed up as a sort of dummy run, a rehearsal right. or surveillance yeah. operation. So we've actually got footage of that. This is video one, so if VT can look to roll us video one. So don't forget, we're looking nine days before here. Oh, and there's the Jaguar parked in the same place again. Yeah, it's, mm. it's, it's parked in the exact same spot as far as we can tell. And, and the car that's highlighted mm. in, the, in the little green box, that is uh, Shazad Tanweer and Mohammed Sadiq Khan, I think, yeah. driving down from Leeds. There they go, they park mm -hmm. again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And a minute later in that footage, they, they go off into the station. So the question is, mm -hmm. you know, what's that Jaguar doing there? I mean, it's, I mean, it's certainly not um, a parking space per se. No, we're no. Actually, actually looking there at, at, at somewhere where you, you can guarantee a traffic warden would be sort of looming within seconds, if not minutes. Yeah, that's to, so, to, yeah. to actually zap them on that. So something suspicious there. Now you were saying about that footage. The, the first clip we'd seen there had been about for ages, mm. but uh, it was only with the inquest that we actually got to see this previous. Um, yeah. Nine day early. Yeah. Um, they had released some of the dummy run CCTV footage. Yeah. Uh, about back in I think 2008 they released some, and I think they released some mm -hmm. just in the days after 7/7. Mm -hmm. But that particular clip that shows the Jaguar in Luton Station car park on 28/6, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, we've only seen that's only become available in recent months on the inquest's mm -hmm. website. Um, and obviously they've had that footage for a yep. long, long time. Yep. It's only now that it's been made available to us. So it's only now that we can see that that Jaguar seems to be in the same spot at the same time as the alleged bombers are in Luton Station and only in that spot at the same time as they are in there. And, and you would think any inquiry would look into just eliminating that... <laughs> Welcome back to On The Edge. I'm Alex G, and I'm here with my special guest, Tom Secker. But first, let's go and see what's been happening on the text. Let's see your comments. Melissa, what uh, abandon do we have from our texters? Uh, a few text messages starting to come in now. Uh, but before the break, uh, Brian77 from our web forum has said, uh, glad that you've got Tom on the show. He said, Seeds of Deconstruction is a very thorough documentary. Oh, a compliment. Lovely. Yes. That's what we like. Uh, Dennis says, why aren't the Met investigating more thoroughly who or what is scaring them off? And he also asks, can you read the number plate of the JAG? 
That's an interesting thing. I, mm. I suppose this is down to the quality of CCTV. Is, mm. is there anyone who's been able to forensically analyse this? With, uh, not uh, that I've seen. I mean, I've, I've looked at that clip a number of times myself, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of other people have. I've never been able to make out a number plate, and I don't think... I don't think the, the, the footage is of good enough quality, or certainly not the releases that we have already. It certainly is this thing with CCTV footage that uh, it's very difficult to make anything stick mm. with, with this quality of material. Because yeah, it, it, the resolution it, just isn't there, the quality of image just isn't there. So if we move on now to some of your major problems, let's mm. say, with the 7-7 official story as it stands, I gather there's um, an interesting little aside concerning explosive residues mm. at, at all the bomb sites that we're talking about here. Yeah. So, yeah. so what's the story there? Well, I mean, the story is that uh, in the initial days after 7-7, all of the reports unanimously were saying these were commercial or military-grade explosives. Yeah. They then discover this supposed bomb factory up in mm -hmm. Leeds, uh, mm -hmm. And the story changes, and they say these are now acetone peroxide. They are homemade right. explosives, yep. TATP, HMTD, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and they've maintained this story, and it's in all of the official reports and in all the media yeah. coverage. Yeah. But the problem is, um, and they confirmed all this in testimony at the inquests, is that they never actually found any chemical residues of the explosive used at any of the four locations. Well, that's very strange. To it say it is least. very strange. I mean, particularly when you consider that possibly with the exception of the bus, but on the tube trains at least. Mm. You're talking about a very small area, or a very sort of compact area. There's yep. not much wind there or rain or anything that would contaminate the scene or wash anything away. Normally, mm -hmm. in that kind of 